My guest today is Dr. Simon Elmer. I'm the head of research of a community interest company called Architects for Social Housing. Over the last three years, I've published three books about what I call the global biosecurity state, the first one called The Road to Fascism, and the second two selections of essays, um, the first one called Virtue and Terror, and the next one, The New Normal. And over the last few months, I've been writing about the environmental, what I call the environmental fundamentalism, which I'm going to talk about today. In the decades that followed the Gulf War of 1990 to 91, a single term came to dominate the foreign policy of the West, and in particular of the United States of America. That term was Islamic fundamentalism. This was used not only to justify the military invasion of sovereign states by US-led coalitions and the subsequent theft of their assets and resources by Western corporations, but it was also used to demonize the occasional attempts of resistance by their defeated populations as terrorism. Now, we heard less during this time about Christian fundamentalism, even though every war instigated by the USA was accompanied by the cry of God bless America, nor did we hear about the fundamentalism of a global market, which under 40 years of neoliberalism has made money the measure of every value in our societies, to the extent that the high priests of finance capitalism no longer speak of profit margins, but of value creation. More recently, however, although its, it's genesis is, is coextensive with this period in Western geopolitics, the predations of Western capitalism have adopted a new strategy. The term that best describes this has not been coined by the propagandists in Washington or Brussels or even in Downing Street, but rather by those of us who recognize a continuity not only in purpose, but also in means between the destabilizing and pillage of the Middle East and the global aspirations of the emerging new world order. This term, this new term, is environmental fundamentalism. Now, I'm using this term in a technical sense to describe this latest strategy of Western imperialism. Because whether their god is called Jehovah, Mammon, or nature with a capital N, the mechanisms of all fundamentalisms are the same. One, to identify sacred texts whose truth cannot be questioned. Two, to authorize and impose a single interpretation of those texts. Three, to dismiss all other interpretations and all contradictory texts as heresy. Four, to silence and punish heretics. And five, <clears throat> to attain and then defend power on the basis of the enforced orthodoxy, which in Western societies we call a democratic or scientific consensus. Now these Overtly religious aims might seem at odds and even incompatible with the politics of an ostensibly secular West in the third decade of the 21st century. But in this presentation, I'm going to show how and why the tenets of environmental fundamentalism serve the ends for which they've been formulated, sanctified, and enforced as part of the new ideological orthodoxies of the global biosecurity state. Now, by this term, I mean the nexus of unelected technocracies, treaties, agendas, regulations, programs, technologies, and ideologies that have emerged from the revolution in Western capitalism being implemented on the justification of responding to multiple manufactured crises, including the health crisis, the energy crisis, the cost of living crisis, the geopolitical crisis, and ultimately, the environmental crisis. Okay, so I've, do, I've broken my presentation, which is quite long, so get a cup of tea or coffee if you're gonna be listening to it. Into four parts. Part one is the economics of fear. As the restrictions and obligations of biosecurity have mostly, but not entirely, been lifted since March 2022, their replacement by their equally fundamentalist environmental equivalents has shown the arbitrariness of the crises on which this global biosecurity state is being imposed and their shared end. Last year's COP27, the United Nations Climate Change Conference 2022, is a demonstration and model of how the forms of global government 
that have assumed so much power over our lives on the justification of responding to these manufactured crises will operate outside of any democratic representation or accountability. Held from the 6th to the 18th of November, 2022 in Egypt, COP27 was the 27th such conference held annually since the first United Nations Climate Agreement in 1992. This subsequently led to the Kyoto Protocol of 1997 and the Paris Agreement of, sorry, the, first, the Paris Agreement of 2015. This committed participating nations, nations to unquestionable orthodoxies. These included what it called the scientific consensus. One, the global warming is occurring to a degree that threatens all life on the planet. And two, that man-made emissions of the carbon dioxide molecule, CO2, which is a compound of one carbon atom bonded with two oxygen atoms, that is the primary source of life on Earth, but which constitutes only 0.04% of the Earth's atmosphere, is causing this warming, primarily from the burning of fossil fuels. Now, <clears throat> the effect of this political agreement is that anyone including climatologists, meteorologists, geologists, biologists, or chemists, who asserts or presents evidence contrary to these assertions, all the conclusions derived from them, is categorized and branded as a climate change denier, exactly as those who question the equally authoritarian and unquestionable orthodoxies of the coronavirus crisis are still branded as COVID deniers. Among numerous voices excluded from this consensus are members of the Global, Global Climate Intelligence Group, whose World Climate Declaration, There Is No Climate Emergency, which you can see here, which was published in October 2022, has been signed by, last time I looked, 1,410 scientists and energy industry professionals from 54 countries around the world, and they're not alone. Now, parties to this fundamentalist orthodoxy and the economic obligations and policies to which you commit them include, by the order of the size of their economy, the USA, China, Japan, Germany, India, the UK, France, Brazil, Italy, Canada, and 182 other countries, which is to say almost the whole world. Now, to address, to address what it melodramatically calls the existential threat of climate change, the UK government has committed to spending 11.6 billion pounds of British taxpayers' money on international climate finance, with funding for what it calls climate adaptation, tripling from 500 million in 2019 to 1.5 billion in 2025. 150 million of that funding will go to what they call protecting rainforests, including in the Amazon and the Congo Basin, the sites of some of, some of the world's largest reserves of the copper and cobalt required for electric batteries. 65 million is earmarked for the Nature, People and Climate Investment Fund in Egypt, with a focus on hydrogen and wind power, and a further 2 billion for the UK-Kenya Strategic Partnership for Clean and Green Investment in Geothermal, Solar Energy and Hydroelectric Power Projects. Now, all this public funding will go to private companies selected by the international technocracies formed to do so in accordance with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. This is a, I call it a Miss World list of humanitarian objectives, ranging from abolishing world hunger and poverty to peace, justice, and gender equality that was adopted by the United Nations in 2015 under the rubric of Agenda 2030. Now, in reality and practice, However, sustainable development goals allocate the flow of global capital, bank loans, investment, and preferential treatment to governments and corporations according to their compliance with the environmental, social, and corporate governance criteria. Now, despite the United Nations branding, these are formulated and imposed by immensely wealthy international corporate asset managers, the most powerful of which BlackRock, the Vanguard Group, and State Street Global Advisor. Between them hold 20% of the shares 
And with it, something like government authority over the 500 largest companies on the New York Stock Exchange. Far from saving the planet from exploitation by predatory corporations, sustainable development goals are designed to increase the monopoly of wealthy Western economies and international companies able to meet their criteria over poorer countries. In doing so, sustainable development goals have created the financial framework for purchasing the United Nations assigned quota of emissions in carbon credits which is one of the market-based mechanisms written into the Kyoto practice as the Kyoto protocol. Now, in practice, this means that in order to offset their obligations to meet goals on carbon emissions, wealthier countries, companies, and even individuals can buy and indeed sell carbon credits from poorer countries and companies. Since carbon emissions are obviously a product of greater productivity, the carbon credit market is a mechanism for increasing inequality between already wealthy companies and nations and those forced to sell their carbon credit. Balancing, the, balancing this up and on the same justification, developing countries will be loaded with debt by financial organizations like the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund in order to fulfill these sustainable development goals and those unable to meet repayments through increased taxation and spending cuts for their already impoverished nation, uh, populations will, of course, be compelled to hand over their land and natural resources to their creditors. Indeed, both sustainable development goals and environmental and social governance criteria are predicated on monetizing the natural world, which has recently been estimated by the New York Stock Exchange at four quadrillion dollars. That's, in case you don't know what that means, I didn't, it means four million billion dollars. Monetized nature is the basis of a new form of corporation called a natural asset company, the purpose of which is to maximize what it calls ecological performance and the production of ecosystem services, over the management of which these corporations will, of course, have legal rights and financial authority. So. Behind their loudly proclaimed green credentials, both these programs, like those implemented on the justification of the coronavirus crisis, are instruments of stakeholder capitalism. Now, as of March 2023, the total value of contracts awarded to companies by the UK government in response to the coronavirus crisis was £47.8 billion. This included 22.8 billion on the utterly useless test and trace program, 14.7 billion pound on largely unusable or undelivered personal protection equipment, 4.1 billion pound on medicines and the almost entirely unused Nightingale hospitals, which were set up in times, kind of these emergency hospitals, which were never used. Now, this vast expenditure of public money on the justification of combating a manufactured threat to public health is a microcosm of how the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals on the justification of combating global warming will allocate the national wealth of the countries party to its obligations to the international companies able to meet the criteria they themselves have imposed. In this respect, the trillions of dollars to which the workers of the West have been placed in debt by their governments on the justification of combating a pandemic which was declared by the World Health, World Health Organization, which of course is an agency of the UN, funded by Western governments and private companies and subject to lobbying from both, and under the pandemic treaty is going to be empowered to unilaterally declare pandemics and impose biosecurity restrictions on signatory nations. This is an example and a model of how the equally manufactured environmental crisis is designed to impoverish their populations and enrich the architects of both this crisis and the power grab it is enabling. Now, we should recall, for those of you who don't know, if you live abroad, here in the UK, which is still the sixth largest economy in the world, all this vast expenditure, which is loading still more debt onto the future of our children, is being implemented at a time when the UK public is facing 60 billion pounds in tax rises and spending cuts 
when our national insurance contributions have been increased by 10%, when the price cap on annual energy costs for a typical household has been set at £3,000, and which has pushed 3.26 million households into fuel poverty by energy companies making record-making profits, when there has been a 19% rise in food prices over the past year, the highest rate since at least 1977, resulting in nearly 3 million people having to use a food bank last year in order to eat. And when, as a result, 8.9 million British citizens and 3.3 million of our children are living in absolute poverty. Part two, the chimera of net zero. Now, creating public compliance with this transfer of billions of pounds from the national taxpayer to international corporations without mandate from the electorate or oversight of how it is spent, by whom or on what, has been achieved by a vast international campaign of propaganda. One of the forms this has taken is the protests by environmental fundamentalist groups like Extinction Rebellion, Insulate Britain, and Just Stop Oil, all of whom are funded by the Climate Emergency Fund. This is an organization established in 2019 to fund such promotional activities, which is what they are, with the largesse of US billionaires, including the heiress to the Getty family oil fortune. They also have the support of our new king, Charles III, who was the Prince of Wales spoke as far back as 1992 at the annual meeting of the World Economic Forum, for whom he has since become the obedient puppet of the corporate membership, as it has masterminded the globalist coup that only began to be revealed with the coronavirus crisis. Indeed, at the annual meeting of the World Economic Forum in January 2020, three months before the World Health Organization announced the pandemic, Prince Charles was chosen to launch what was dubbed as the Great Reset. As a result of this backing from the corporate and its public shills, the public, public corporate sector and its public shills, our government, our municipal authorities, and our police forces have granted these groups apparent freedom to shut down UK roads for hours, and the antics of a handful of their activists receive millions of pounds of media coverage denied to the millions of UK citizens who marched in protest against illegal lockdown and mandates. Now, I'm not claiming that these activists are hired actors or not sincere in their infantile beliefs. The best salesman is someone who believes in their product. And there is no need to hire, hire crocodile tears when a generation of lacrimose kids and apocalyptic greens will shed theirs for free. Indeed, just Stop Oil's imperious declaration on its website, which I'm producing here, that if you are not in resistance, you are appeasing evil, is typical of the religious rhetoric of these environmental fundamentalists. And just as authoritarian as Black Lives Matter's motto that silence is violence, or indeed Extinction Rebellion's demand for zero carbon. Only a demographic as politically naive as the Western middle classes could possibly believe that the globalists, international bankers, and corporate CEOs implementing Agenda 2030 will save the planet. But their absolutist rhetoric makes it clear that they are willing to impoverish the rest of the world to realize their fundamentalist religious beliefs. Now, of course, we've seen this before. And I don't mean the suicide bombers and iconoclasts of Islamic fundamentalist groups that I started with. There's a parallel between the fanciful solutions proposed to avert the imminent prospect of environmental disaster and the belief in the effectiveness of wearing medical masks designed to be used within a sterilized operating theater, or standing two meters apart when outside, or placing acetate screens between tables and indoor venues, or washing our hands in antibacterial gel at the entrance and exit to every building, and in all the other stage props in the theater of biosecurity invented to combat the virus. Last April, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change declared that annual greenhouse emissions, gas emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, must be reduced by 43% by 2030 and reach 
net zero emissions by 2050. This will so supposedly be achieved not only by enforced restrictions on our energy and food consumption, but also through our embrace of highly inefficient technologies like wind turbines, solar panels, and electric batteries, in the illusory belief that over the next three decades, these supposedly renewable sources of energy, which currently provide just 2% of global energy, can replace coal, petroleum, and natural gas, which currently provide about 82%. The problem is, <clears throat> unlike the silicon technologies that have transformed computer power exponentially over the, last, the past few decades, the energy required to move people about, to drive machines, to produce heat or grow food, is determined by properties of nature, whose boundaries are set by the laws of gravity, inertia, friction, mass, and thermodynamics. Even the vast resources of propaganda disposed of by the World Economic Forum cannot overcome the realities of energy production and storage. These realities, which are both physical and economic, include the following. Hydrocarbons, that is, the energy component of fossil fuels, that is crude oil, natural gas, and coal, which insofar as they've been produced by solar energy in ancient seas and forests are 100% organic, today supply over 80% of the world's energy, while solar and wind today supply less than 2%. The small 2% decline in the share of hydrocarbons in the world energy use entailed over $2 trillion in cumulative global spending on alternatives over that period. Now, if the 4 billion poor people in the world increase their energy use to just one third of Europe's per capita level, global demand would rise to an amount equal to twice the total consumption of the USA, which consumes 16% of the world's energy. Replacing US hydrocarbon-based electric generation over the next 30 years would require a construction program building the grid at a rate 14 times greater than at any time in history. Eliminating hydrocarbons to make US electricity would leave still leave 70% of US hydrocarbon use unaffected. For security and reliability, an average of two months of national demand for hydrocarbons are in storage at any time in the US. Today, barely two hours of national electricity demand can be stored in all utility scale batteries plus all batteries in the 1 million electric cars in the US. Batteries produced annually by Elon Musk's Tesla Gigafactory, several of them now, this is the world's biggest one, the world's biggest factory, and store three minutes worth of annual US electric demand. To make enough batteries to store two days worth of demand would require 1,000 years of production by the Gigafactory. A 100 times growth in the number of electric vehicles to 400 million on the roads by 2040 would displace just 5% of global oil demand. Renewable energy would have to expand 90-fold to replace hydrocarbons in two decades. It took 50 years for petroleum production to expand just 10-fold. Storing the energy equivalent of one barrel of oil which weighs 300 pounds, requires 20,000 pounds and $200,000 worth of Tesla batteries. It takes the energy equivalent of 100 barrels of oil to fabricate the batteries to store the energy equivalent of a single barrel of oil. As the history of road building has demonstrated, efficiency doesn't reduce, but instead increases the demand for energy. Since 1995, when global energy efficiency has improved by 33%, total world energy use rose by 50%, an amount equal to adding two entire United States worth of demand. Every $1 billion in aircrafts produced leads to $5 billion in aviation fuel consumed, over two decades to operate them. Global spending on new jets is more than $50 billion a year and rising. Also, Every $1 billion spent on the data centers on which the fourth industrial revolution relies 
leads to $7 billion in electricity consumed over two decades. Global spending on data centers is more than $100 billion a year and rising. It has been predicted that by 2025, communications technology will account for more than 20% of global energy consumption and 5.5% of carbon emissions. Over a 30 year period, $1 million worth of a utility scale solar or wind facility produces respectively 40 million and 55 million kilowatt hours. By contrast, one million worth of shale well produces enough natural gas to generate 300 million kilowatt hours over 30 years. It costs roughly the same to build one shale well or two wind turbines. However, the latter combined produces the equivalent energy of 0.7 barrels of oil per hour, while the shale rig averages 10 barrels of oil per hour. Wind and solar machines produce energy on average an average of 25 to 30% of the time, and only when nature accommodates. Conventional power plants can operate nearly continuously and are available when needed. And finally, about 60 pounds of batteries are needed to store the energy equivalent of one pound of hydrocarbons. At least 100 pounds of materials are mined, moved, and processed for every pound of battery fabricated. It costs less than 50 cents, 50 cents American cents to store a barrel of oil or its equivalent in natural gas, while it costs $200 to store the equivalent energy of a barrel of oil in electric batteries. Finally, a battery centric energy grid, an electric vehicle world, would mean mining gigatons, that is, billions of metric tons more of the earth to access lithium, copper, nickel, graphite, rare earths, cobalt, etc., and using millions of tons of oil and coal, both in mining and to fabricate metals and concrete. So, if the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change goal of net zero by 2050 is neither a challenge nor an opportunity, as the attendees of this year's annual meeting of the World Economic Forum boasted, but as these figures show, a physical and economic impossibility, we should be asking what the enforcement of the policies, policies it has been used to justify will mean for us, to what end these restrictions are being put and to whose benefit. Now, in the interest of disclosure, this data was published in March 2019 by Mark P. Mills. The, quote, the figures I just quoted, the economic and physical restrictions limits now, he's a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, and he's also a faculty member at Northwestern University's McCormick School of Engineering and Applied Science, where he co-directs an Institute on Manufacturing Science and Innovation. He's also a strategic partner with Cottonwood Venture Partners. That's an energy tech venture fund. Previously, Mark P. Mills was a technology advisor for Bank of America Securities. And before that, he served in the White House Science Office. Early in his career, he was an experimental physicist and development engineer at Bell Northern Research. So he is very much an industry insider. However, until environmental fundamentalists can answer the questions this data raises with something more than denouncing Mr. Mills as a right-wing conspiracy theorist and climate change denier, these kind of questions will continue to hang over what he calls the magical thinking of the so-called sustainable energy economy. In reality, the energy produced by these new technologies is a new commodity, the promotion of which suppresses the fact that producing millions of electric vehicles to replace the existing ones taxed and find out of use, or in London, they're being uh, redundant by the mayor's ultra low emission zone, or erecting hundreds of thousands of wind turbines with a 15 to 20 year lifespan or demolishing hundreds of thousands of social and public housing homes to make way for so-called passive housing, market sale properties, or mining the lithium, cobalt, and copper for the vast increase in the number of batteries required to harness these energy sources is far more destructive to our environment and to the people who live in it, which will often get forgotten, but far more lucrative 
to the companies and governments with access to the technology and the natural resources of other countries. The refusal to see the environmental, social, economic, and even political costs of the total cycle of extraction, manufacture, construction, transportation, demolition, and disposal within which these new technologies operate sustainably, and to stare instead with blinkered eyes at the carbon cost of their operational performance alone, this is part of the willing blindness with which the chimera of net zero has been conjured into being. Now, my own company, Architects for Social Housing, has extensive knowledge of this argument, which over the last decade has been used to justify the demolition of London's social housing, what you call public housing in the US, in the middle of a crisis of housing affordability. Now, to counter this argument, we commissioned environmental engineers to produce estimates of the carbon cost of the entire life cycle of housing estates, beginning with extraction of the raw materials, their transformation and processing into building material, the construction of the buildings and infrastructure, the lifespan of their inhabitation and uses, their management and maintenance or operational carbon, and finally, the energy required to demolish and dispose of them. And the conclusion is clear. No matter how improved is the thermal performance of the new buildings, it is impossible for them to recoup the total carbon cost of demolition, disposal, and redevelopment of the old buildings within the 60-year predicted lifespan of the new developments. For the same reasons, CO2 emissions from the production of an electric car are 70% higher than in the manufacture of a petrol-driven car because of the resources consumed in the production of lithium ion batteries. Like the figures I quoted above on so-called sustainable energy sources, these are empirically verifiable givens. They cannot be explained away by environmental fundamentalists, no matter how much their corporate backers use their financial clout to try and silence those who raise them. The truth is sustainable energy, in quotation marks, and the resources of which it disposes constitutes a newly emergent market requiring new relations of production, new rights of ownership, new regulations of distribution, and new controls of consumption, which are going to be already are being enforced by an authoritarian reduction, not only in our standard of living, but also of our rights and freedoms. And with them, the sovereignty of governments over their national wealth, assets, and resources. Okay, part three the ideology of science. It's unclear what the environmental fundamentalists hope to achieve with their demands, which if realized will condemn hundreds of millions in the global south to starvation and billions more to increased poverty and hunger. About half the world's current population relies on fertilizers and pesticides to produce the food it needs to eat. And as the recent example of Sri Lanka demonstrated, Eliminating the fossil fuels on which both are dependent, that is, fertilizers and pesticides, will have devastating consequences. Under net zero agricultural policies imposed in April 2021, in the guise of that favorite illusion of Western consumers going organic, rice production in Sri Lanka dropped by more than 50%, and domestic prices increased by 80%. Inflation in the country reached 54%. 90% of the population were forced to skip meals. And in May 2022, less than a year later, Sri Lanka defaulted on its debts. Thankfully, the people rose up and overthrew the government. But this is what net zero achieved in a year in a country previously referred to as the rice bowl of the West. Now, Doubtless, the environmental fundamentalists of the West know or care about the mere material little, know or care little about the material consequences of their religious dogma. But their naivety about the ends to which their beliefs are being put is the legacy of this generation. Born into austerity and identity politics, raised by iPhones and social media, in debt, in this country, £30,000, in the US probably considerably more, for a degree nobody wants. Graduated to masks, locked down. They're so alienated from themselves and the world 
they experience through social media, they don't even know what sex they are, yet they think they can save the planet. They're what I call the new compliant. The images of hysterical weeping children, this is one, chained to bridges or glued to a painting, accusing an imaginary father figure of stealing their future through the screens of smartphones. The footage from which is then sent around the world by international media companies promoting Agenda 2030, this is the new model of citizenship in the global biosecurity state. Like all arguments that use the threat of a crisis to justify coercive action by the forces of the state, the effect of environmental fundamentalism is to circumvent critical thinking, to silence questions, and to pathologize disagreement as denial. Indeed, the intended ideological reach of environmental fundamentalism over the British public is written out by chapter and verse in the report published by the House of Lords Environment and Climate Change Committee in October 2022, and I'm showing you a screenshot here. Yeah. It's called In Our Hands, Behaviour Change for Climate and Environmental Goals. And I recommend it to anyone who doubts the extent to which this fundamentalist ideology has taken over our politics and civil liberties. <clears throat> now, so that it's clear, the report is open about whose behaviour has to change. As you might expect, it isn't multinational corporations. It is now governments. It isn't the US military, the world's biggest institutional consumer of petroleum, which if it were a country in fuel usage alone would be the 47th largest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world. And it isn't the lords, ladies, baronesses, bishops, and dukes who sit on this House of Lords committee. No, it's our behavior they want to change. Our consumption of food, our heating of our homes, our use of transport, our consumer goods, our leisure activities. Now, like the equally manufactured health, energy, food, and geopolitical crises with which we are threatened today, the purpose of the environmental crisis is to dismantle our institutions of democracy, to erase our human rights, to remove our freedoms, to automate our jobs, bankrupt our businesses, leaving us impoverished and defenseless against the predations of capital. The authority of the estate and the dictates of unelected, unaccountable, and increasingly autocratic transnational technologies. We will be happy, apparently, and own nothing. Now, <clears throat> the full extent of our intended immiseration is made clear in absolute zero. This is a report commissioned by the UK government and collectively produced by the universities of Oxford, Cambridge, Bath, Nottingham, Strathclyde, and Imperial College London. The latter of which you may remember was responsible for the completely inaccurate modeling that justified the lockdown of the UK for two years and was also quoted in the US, wasn't it? This report was published in November, 2019, as the world entered its second and long expected global financial crisis in 12 years, at which point $11 trillion of quantitative easing was created to bail out the banks in a little over six months. This in turn necessitated the suspension of trade to avoid the hyperinflation that would have ensued had these vast sums entered into, uh, were allowed to enter into the real economy. And as they have entered, we've seen that inflation over the world is going through the roof. However, as we can see, and I'm showing you here a screen grab from this report, <clears throat> showing the reduction between now 2030, so agenda 2030, and then uh, net zero at 2050. <clears throat> as we can see, the economic wreckage, the ruined businesses and destroyed lives left by two years of lockdown is nothing compared to what the environmental fundamentalists have planned for us. By 2030, this is in seven years, if they have their way, all airports will be closed. This is in the UK. Shipping will be reduced to zero. Beef and lamb will be prohibited. And cement and concrete will also be banned. By 2050, net zero time, road use will be 60% of current usage. Flying and shipping will both be banned, except presumably for the rich when they fly off to their meetings in Davos. Heating, cooking, and energy use will also be reduced to 60% of today. Manufacturing will be reduced to 50%. And all fossil fuels will be banned. Think of this in the context of what was done in Sri Lanka 
just to agriculture alone. Net zero, quite clearly and openly, is a program of global immiseration and disenfranchisement. Indeed, as I said, based on what happened in Sri Lanka in a single year, I don't think it's too much to say that net zero is a genocidal program of global depopulation. So, <laughs> why on the population is net zero plans to reduce rising up against these plans? There are numerous examples of how the discourse of environmental fundamentalism is used to silence and circumvent criticism of its dictates. On the 9th of May this year, there was a sudden downpour in southeast England, causing flooding in some places. One of the environmental fundamentalists to cite this as proof of environmental catastrophe was Dr. Charlie Gardner, He's one of the more vocal members of Scientists for Extinction Rebellion. He's the guy up here with the, the, in this photograph with the microphone. Now, posting footage of flooding in the village of Tipton St. John, near Sidmouth and East Devon, you don't know where that is, he wrote, this is a scientist writing here, can we please stop listening to the people saying there's no need to change anything? Now, I'll pass over for the moment that this is a statement that no scientist should be making. But in response, I pointed out that such flooding is caused by building on floodplains, containing rivers and canals, overdeveloping land, laying tarmac and concrete over soil, thereby preventing drainage, um, through industrial monoculture farming that dries out the soil so that it cannot soak up periodic increases in rainfall, and a myriad of other causes relating to land use. What needs changing is not to whom we should be listening, although we could certainly do with turning down the volume on environmental uh, activists. What needs changing is how planning authorities financed by developers and investors use land in this country. And I imagine uh, across the West, we've got the same thing going on now, haven't we, with these, these, these forest fires in Canada, which are caused, caused by land use. Bringing this about, however, is achieved, is achieved, bringing these real changes about in land use is achieved not by lying in the road, but through real activism. As we know at Architects for Social Housing, my company, this means hard and unrewarded work with local communities to produce practical measures for beneficial change that don't involve impoverishing and disenfranchising the population for the benefit of corporate forms of government. Now, in 2017, Ash, sorry, Architects for Social Housing, we started working with the, housing, with the housing cooperative to refurbish and improve the Patmore estate in South London. I'm showing you here um, one, of, one of the uh, images we produced in our report. Like, like the nearby Battersea Power Station, this is built on a floodplain for the River Thames that was formerly marshland. So under the planning authority of the Vauxhall Nine Elms Battersea Opportunity Area, the regeneration of this industrial and residential part of London is now, has been, is still one of the largest building sites in Europe, throwing up high-rise, high-value, high-priced market sell properties for investment. The environment, however, is a radical leveler in who and what it affects, and rainwater doesn't stop falling at the edge of upmarket gated communities. What many architects appear not to know, and fewer developers want to hear, is that the first consideration in any development is the management of water not that which is piped into the homes and offices of the occupants, but the water that falls from the sky. And if it is not given a means of egress and proper drainage, can cause flooding. This can be ameliorated in various ways through green roofs that absorb flash flooding, but first and foremost, by not building on floodplains in the first instance. However, as an explanation of flooding, and I'm showing you here, um, the, on the inset here is, is a, it's a still from footage which was put up by this, this doctor. As an explanation of flooding and a challenging to change how planning legislation is made and planning approval is granted in a public sector which has been captured by corporate finance, that's not as sexy as saving the planet from yet another crisis and is unlikely to attract thousands of youthful activists looking to change the world in a weekend's protest. Demarge. A short bit of research on my part revealed that the Tipton St. John, the Tipton St. John, if you can see here, is built on the floodplains between two bends of the River Otter. This accounts for its history of flooding, goes back 
long time, and that new residential and also that new residential properties are being built there by persimmon homes. Now, perhaps the average house price in the village being eight hundred and twelve point five thousand pound played a part in the local planning authority granting the developer permission. But I can imagine the farmers on the hills either side, which you can see, um, having a bit of laugh at them <clears throat> because they've seen the flood floodplain flood for decades. Now, unfortunately, Dr. Gardner and others like him wear their white coats like a priest wears his cassock. And with the same claim to be the keeper of an unchallengeable truth, truth with a capital T. But what is clear from this example and many others of his irresponsible and Einstein scientific fear-mongering is that donning a white coat doesn't mean you know what you're talking about. Except perhaps in the eyes of a public bullied over the last three years into regarding doctors and scientists as the final arbiters of what we can and cannot do. But the absolutism of their statements are the exact opposite of the principles of scientific inquiry which is based not on stopping people from asking questions, but rather on asking the right ones and then working to produce the correct answers. Like all fundamentalisms, environmental fundamentalism silences critical and scientific inquiry. Another example, on the 17th of July, 2022, two days after the UK Health Security Agency, this was a new organization formed under lockdown, had declared a heat emergency. Members, uh, degree, I think, got over 30 degrees in the country. Members of Doctors for Extinction Rebellion broke the windows of the office of JP Morgan Chase, the International Financial Services and Investment Bank in London's Canary Wharf. Their stated justification for doing so followed the following chain of deductions, which began with the now familiar premise that one, global warming is increasing because of man made climate change. Two, the primary cause of climate change is burning fossil fuels. Three, JP Morgan is the world's biggest financier of fossil fuels. Four, the two days in which the UK was predicted to have temperatures of 40 degrees Celsius are proof of this climate crisis, just two days. Five, climate crisis is a health crisis that threatens life on Earth. Six, medical professionals sign a code of conduct that includes the obligation to act without delay believe, if they believe that there is a risk to patient safety or public protection. Seven patients under their care, including those suffering from dementia and mental stress, will die as a consequence of this two-day heat wave, apparently. And therefore, it is the obligation of medical professionals to do all they can to stop the cause of this heat crisis. Now, one might ask, we might question, why medical professionals are now so concerned about their code of conduct, especially when they have ignored their Hippocratic oath to first do no harm, with far more immediate and far more devastating consequences than their wild predictions about the effects of two days of hot weather. We might also wonder about their willingness in the wake of two years of lockdown restrictions that have killed tens of thousands of UK citizens denied medical care to so readily use the by now familiar language of health an emergency to advertise their process and ask whose agenda their protest is furthering. Nor do they appear to be interested in drawing attention to the investment of JP Morgan and other international financial institutions and asset managers in the Agenda 2030 development programs, to which just about every government of the member states of the UN have signed up without consultation with their parliaments or populations or in the influence such institutions have on the organizations and global governments they form, and which increasingly dictate the policies of our national governments. But why should they? When it's precisely these programs, which Stinks and Rebellion and its subsidiaries have been formed to promote. Now, if we don't recognize the names of these companies, which I put up here, these are just some of the partners of the World Economic Forum. If we don't recognize, and I'm sure, unfortunately, that members of Extinction Rebellion don't recognize these companies that are partnered with the Alconet. They partnered with the World Economic Forum in March 2020. They should, we should, because they are overseeing the stakeholder capitalism that is the political economy of the new world order. Totalitarian governments, and that's what we're moving into, have always been an adept at mobilizing the masses into the spectacle of the people. That's whether that's in organized marches or apparently 
spontaneous protests in order to further their control over the isolated and lonely individuals who, through their willing participation, imagine and are encouraged to believe that they constitute just such a political body, such a force for change towards a single great idea. My point in quoting the arguments of these protests by Extinction Rebellion here, however, is less to take issue with the factual content of their claims than to show how ideology functions to create from a first premise derived from a widely accepted idea, an unbreakable chain of logical deductions that require no thinking from those who repeat and follow them for their seemingly logical and unavoidable conclusion, and which of course demand and justify extreme actions. The unrepentant collaboration of the medical profession in the manufactured health crisis has shown that behind their masks and their colored smocks, doctors and nurses are skilled technicians and little more. And with a very few and honorable exceptions, do not have the time, the education, the disposition, or the ability to make judgments about the efficacy, necessity, or consequences of restrictions and programs that have laid the foundations for the global biosecurity state. The absurd elevation of the profession in the eyes of the general public to the final arbiters of our politics, laws, rights, and freedoms has undoubtedly gone to the heads of many of its members, not least these teary-eyed acolytes sitting hand in hand outside JP Morgan. What a sight they are. But Extinction Rebellion and their financiers have been quick to utilize this newly accorded status in the service of their own agenda to promote crisis capitalism. In this respect, although the ideology of environmental crisis preceded that of biosecurity, the latter replicated the former's logical deductions to arrive at conclusions with even greater consequences for the politics, laws, and cultures of the neoliberal democracies of the West. No one will be unfamiliar with this chain of deductions, every one of which has been proven to be either factually false or logically inconsequent, none of which, of course, has done anything to alter the apparently irrefutable argument they form in the minds of the indoctrinated. So this is, <clears throat> this is this chain of deductions from a first principle, the first one of which is coronavirus is a new pathogen, constituting an unprecedented threat that, if not stopped, will kill 40 million people in the first year or more. Two, the virus is transmitted from person to person via surfaces, aerosols, and droplets. Three, asymptomatic transmission is the primary driver of infection, so everyone is a potential threat to the lives of others. Four, the huge numbers of infections and deaths recorded with a positive PCR test are proof of the virulence and fatality rate of the virus. Five, the public health crisis is a pandemic that threatens the entire world. Six, citizens have an obligation to sacrifice their freedoms and rights for the greater good until this health crisis is over. Seven, people will die if we don't all obey the regulations and programs of biosecurity, including social distancing, mandatory masking, contact tracing, swab testing, and lockdown restrictions, all of which brought us to that fatal deduction. Only mass vaccination of the entire population of the planet will allow governments to remove these restrictions and build back better to the new normal. Now, just as this chain of deductions without thinking led us in just two years to the global biosecurity state, so too the environmental crisis, whose deductive logic so far has been almost universally adopted by the governments, civil institutions, and private corporations of the West, will continue far beyond its current conclusions. The first premise of global warming is being used to form a chain of deductions that in their furtherance of totalitarian domination parallel those of the global biosecurity state when it made injection condition of our citizenships. In the Netherlands, which is the second largest exporter of agricultural goods in the world after the USA, farmers are being forced to kill a third of their livestock to meet their government's zero carbon uh, commitments. In Ireland, the government is planning to kill 200,000 cows to meet so-called emissions targets. And if you remember last year, the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, proposed a mandatory target for reduced electricity use during peak hours. In order, as she expressed it with a by now familiar justification 
to flatten the curve. And it doesn't stop there. At this year's annual meeting of the World Economic Forum held in Davos in Switzerland, the ideologues and architects of the global biosecurity stage on the justification of responding to numerous manufactured crises, elected themselves to form an openly technocratic author authoritarian world government presiding over the new corporate-led political economy they call stakeholder capitalism. This, in effect, is a rebranded fascism for the 21st century. It's a form of corporatism. Satya Nadella, who's the chief executive officer of Microsoft, said they are producing software that through what he calls carbon accounting, allows banks to measure the carbon footprint of small businesses before granting them loans. Jin Hagemann-Schnaber, the chairman of Siemens, the largest excuse me, industrial manufacturing company in Europe, called not for a reduction in production, but for what he said, a billion people to stop eating meat. Patricia Popper, the chief executive officer of the Pacific Gas and Electricity Corporation, said that in order to, trans to transition to an electric grid, an automated system will make it possible to turn off supply to smart devices, Wi-Fi, and electric vehicles. And Bastien Giraud, a Green Party member of the Swiss National Council and corporate sustainability advisor to a Swiss carbon finance consultancy, said that government should only buy from companies compliant with the Sustainable Development Goals of Agenda 2030, and that we should build environments in which people not only cannot, but do not want to use cars. He called this living in harmony with nature. And finally, Al Gore, the former US Vice President, current board member of Apple and the World Economic Forum, and the senior advisor to Google, in a speech posted on Just Stop Oil's YouTube channel, threatened us with rain bombs, I'm not sure what those are, boiling oceans, and a billion climate refugees that will take away our capacity for self-governance unless we act now. There he is over there. Now, as the Italian critic and political commentator Umberto Eco warned us long ago, such bullish and bullying calls to action have always been the hallmark of fascist movements who are ideologically opposed to critical thought, which they do everything they can to censor, while slandering and dismissing those who dare to question their dogma. The trouble is, the United Nations and other institutions have been making the same threat for decades in order to increase their power over us. In 1989, when I was still in college, that's how long ago it was, the UN predicted we had until the year 2000 to reverse global warming. Otherwise, melting ice caps would result in sea levels rising three feet, entire countries being submerged, and millions of eco-refugees, kind of a full seeing of uh, uh, what uh, Al Gore said. And many other fantasies from the apocalypse factory of environmental fundamentalism. If someone keeps crying wolf over and over, eventually the wolf has to come, or people will come to the conclusion that the crier is lying. Unfortunately, as George Orwell predicted, we've been taught to reject the evidence of our own eyes and ears. It is in the imminently imposed programs and technologies of the World Health Organization's Global Digital Health Certification Network of its Pandemic Prevention Preparedness and Response Treaty, of the Bank of International Settlements Central Bank Digital Currency, and in the fast approaching deadlines of the United Nations Agenda 2030. It is in all these that the deductions from these respective health and environmental crises will meet in a new and properly totalitarian world order in which the entire natural world will be monetized and converted into financial capital bonds. As Hannah Arendt, the great theorist of totalitarianism, warned us even longer ago, the more these ideologies converge, the more they divest themselves of the ideas they claim to realize whether that's saving us from a deadly virus or saving the planet from us, both of which are devoured by the logic of totalitarian domination. Every argument that starts with the terror of a crisis and then uses it to justify coercive action does so in order to circumvent critical thinking. And whether the new speak slogans 
are those of the UK government, which were displayed on the podiums from which they announced biased security regulations to the nation for two years, things like stay home, protect the NHS, save lives, or those of Extinction Rebellion today, laid out on the pavements from which they continue to stage their promotions for Adrenta 2030, like this, act now, stop ecocide, save lives. Their shared aim is to form an unbreakable chain of deductions that obviates and indeed precludes our capacity for thinking. Okay, fourth and final part, the protest of the elite. But that's not all. In addition to silencing critical questions, protest groups promoting the ideology of environmental fundamentalism also serve another function for which the religious acolytes, only too ready to offer themselves for arrest, appear to be equally ignorant. Now, this is a UK context, but just as Black Lives Matter and Extinction Rebellion were cited as justification for the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Act 2022, which was passed in this country last year, so the vandalism by Just Stop Oil and Insulate Britain. These activists, as I said, have apparently unimpeded access to the city with the highest level of security in Europe. These have been cited by the UK government as justification for the Public Order Act, as you can see in this screenshot here, that has removed even more of our freedoms. This is why, this is why, environmental activists can park a pink yacht on Oxford Circus in the middle of London. It's why they can shut down Westminster Bridge or Trafalgar Square, spray paint across the Houses of Parliament, shatter the windows of J.P. Morgan City offices, which you can see here, empty milk bottles across the floor of the Harrods department store, or glue themselves to priceless works of art in the National Gallery, and the police refuse to arrest them. Compared to that, a few months before, UK citizens were carried off by the same police for holding a sheet of paper saying, not my king, during the coronation of King Charles. And a few months before that, we were violently assaulted for not wearing a mask or leaving our homes without permission. Now, the Metropolitan Police Service is one of the largest, best equipped and well-funded police forces in the world, with 43,000 personnel and an annual budget of 3.8 billion pounds. If it didn't want to stop activists blocking roads in London, they wouldn't be able to do so. The UK also has the highest density of CCTV cameras in Europe, with one for every 10 of the population in London. It's the security of Goldman Sachs, the World Academy, and Westminster Palace was so easy to circumvent. It wouldn't be these innocents who made their way inside, trust me. It would be organizations of far greater reason to resent the UK's state. They can do so with such ease and lack of consequence because their protests are corporate funded advertisements for Agenda 2030. They're there by invitation. Invitation of the London mayor, who shares their environmental fundamentalism. Invitation under the protection of the Metropolitan Police Service and British Transport Police, and with the support of the UK media. Finally, with the authorization of the UK government, and ultimately, they're there in the service of the international technocracies composing this new world government. In stark contrast to which, the millions of UK citizens who in the spring and summer of 2021 protested without trespass or vandalism against illegal lockdowns and mandates and passports, we received a very different welcome from the Metropolitan Police Service. There's a screenshot of one of the videos of what they did to us. They used extraordinary levels of violence to attack and arrest us. We were universally censored by the media who refused to report marches of half a million or more UK citizens from all over the country. We were ignored and ridiculed by those we have elected to represent us in Parliament, and we were subsequently threatened by the government with increased powers of police arrests, fines, and criminal sanctions. The increasingly frequent scenes of members of the working public, infuriated not only by a handful of environmental activists blocking London's roads with impunity, but also by the refusal of the Metropolitan Police Force to remove them, hides the fact that in doing so, the police are not only enforcing the not only not enforcing the law, but they are actually interfering with the public's rights. Despite their consistently and growingly thuggish behaviour, the police do not have some extra legal right over the British people. They are, to quote the former Justice of the Supreme Court, Lord Sumption, 
citizens in uniform. And as citizens, we have as much right as they to see the law observed, although with different powers of intervention. Under Section 137 of the Highways Act 1980, it is an offence willfully to obstruct free passage along a highway. And the offender is liable to a fine or imprisonment for a term not exceeding six months. It's a very serious offence in this country. Now, whether or not our police forces refuse to enforce that law, under Section 24A of the Police and Criminal Evidence Act 1984, a UK citizen can carry out an arrest if he or she has reasonable grounds for believing it is necessary to prevent, under Section 4A, a person causing physical injury to himself or to others. Now, sitting in a busy road in central London and impeding the passage of hundreds of furious drivers clearly constitutes such grounds. Any UK citizen clearing a road of a deliberate threat to safety and order is therefore acting within UK law. Question is, where does that leave the right to protest, which is already under threat by these, uh, these new acts uh, that have been passed, as I mentioned earlier? A simple answer to that is that just as Agenda 2030 isn't a popular cause, but a program of the United Nations that has been formulated by and for the benefit of international corporations, so too the activities of environmental activists aren't protests. They're corporate-funded public relations stunts. Protests, by contrast, and this is a photo I took of one of the marches against the illegal lockdown of the British public in the spring of 2021, Real protest is when a substantial body of people will assert their right to occupy a public space, whether that's a municipal park, uh, sorry, a municipal square, a park, a building, or a public highway, in order to bring public attention to their cause. If that means blocking a major road, that right should be balanced against the rights of the users of the road. And clearly, when several thousand, or in this case, <laughs> half a million or more people, march along a street, in order to draw attention to their cause, they should be allowed to do so. A measure of this balance is that drivers of the vehicles blocked by what they recognize as a protest, whether or not they agree with its cause, they don't get out of their cars and vans and start physically removing individual protesters from the road because the mass of protesters makes that an impossible task. Now, in contrast to this, when tiny groups of half a dozen people are repeatedly blocking roads used by hundreds, if not thousands, of drivers on a weekly and increasingly a daily basis, their right to protest is infringing on the rights of the far greater number of road users to move about the city. It's clear that Just Stop Oil and their fellow activists are not blocking roads in order to draw attention to their corporate agenda. Rather, the point of their activity is to block roads, the use of which, the use of which they have identified as an evil, and that the Metropolitan Police have been given instructions by the same authorities to permit them to break the UK law. The, police, the incidents of police assaulting and arresting members of the public who try to clear the roads themselves, as is their right, as I've just said, amply demonstrate that the police aren't upholding UK law. In effect, the police are uniformed activists enforcing the dictates of the unelected globalists who want to take away the constitutional freedoms of the UK public on the justification of saving the planet. Indeed, as you can see in this photo here, far outnumbering the handful of Just Stop All activists, it is the police who constitute the protest. So what's their goal? Apart from the uh, localized interference, these protests are habituating an outraged public to the permanent restriction of our freedom of movement. This is in the process of being imposed on a permanent basis by local and municipal authorities across the UK under the direction of the World Economic Forum and its urban panopticon of 15-minute cities. Like the systematic reduction in our standards of living, the closing of roads with physical bollards, this is an example here, these kind of planted ones, and the system of surveillance monitoring and enforcing these restrictions will fundamentally change the social contract without consulting the people on whom it is being unilaterally imposed, and certainly without our vote. And like the actions of these police-protected activists, these restrictions illegally interfere with our freedom of movement, specifically under Protocol Number 4, Article 2 of the European Convention on Human Rights. <clears throat> 
As these images show, the police are not policing these protests. They are part of them. And it's a part that, given the police are operating above the law, the general public are prohibited from opposing. What we're seeing here is the emergence, I think it has emerged, of a fully politicized police force that is operating beyond the law of the land and in contravention of our constitutional rights and freedoms. And of course, the enormous media coverage for such incidents increases the public's sense of political impotence over our own lives. It's enormous levels in this country at the moment of disenfranchisement from the law and its enforcement by both the police and the courts, of confusion about the motivations for permitting this apparently unending lawlessness, and of growing anger at changes to our lives and country for which we have not been consulted and certainly haven't voted. All of this renders the public even more susceptible to government and corporate propaganda. It is also exacerbating the class war that is being waged between the corporate elite who are creating the regulations and programs, depriving us of our civil liberties, and political agencies, and the workers, households, and communities are true where they are targeted. In this war, the middle classes, as they did certainly in this country, with mandatory masking, legal lockdowns, are speaking for and with the same words as the international elite from whom they derive their political, economic, and legal power over the workers. You don't have to be a sociologist to see the very clear divide between the lorry drivers, the self-employed builders, the electricians and plumbers, delivery men, parents, dropping their children off at school before driving to work, and all the other Londoners trying to keep our heads above the spiraling cost of living in the capital, and the green-haired activists, performance artists, aging hippies, who seem to have the time and money to sit in rows between university lectures designing banners in their studios and working from their parents' suburban homes or returning to their home county cottages. The divide is very, very clear and apparent. It's indicative of where their class allegiances lie and from where their, where their financial support comes from. The Just Stop Oil never try to block access to 10 Downing Street, you don't know the site of our government, or of Whitehall, our civil service, or Buckingham Palace, residents of our king, all the private residents of senior politicians or, of course, corporate CEOs. If they did, there is no doubt whatsoever that the police would enforce the law and have them off their feet, not in the hour or longer it takes them, when interfering with the freedoms of working men and women, but in seconds. And the charges they would face would not be dropped by the accommodating courts and pro bono lawyers with a slap of the wrist, which is what they get at the moment. It's entirely in keeping with the class divisions, the class divisions being built into our supposedly human rights, that the London mayor's ultra low emission zone, which now encompasses the entire capital, is a fine based restriction, which disproportionately restricts the freedoms of the working class over those able to afford the otherwise prohibitive rise in the cost of driving in the capital. No one appears to have asked why members of Just Stop Oil turned up with both the media and the police apparently notified in advance to protest at the recent coronation of King Charles, when he has been one of the key figures in popularizing the politics and environmental fundamentalism in this country for decades, before even most of the youthful activists mouthing his credos were even born. The answer I would suggest lies in, the overcome, in overcoming the paradox of this movement. The activists given free reign to interfere with our constitu constitutional rights present themselves as young, radical, fearless, anti-establishment, as oppressed by the police, as standing up to corporate power. Now, in reality, as I've tried to show in this presentation, they are protected by the police. They are exonerated by the courts, they are given extraordinary freedoms to flaunt the authoritative legislation around public space and protest by our government and municipal authorities. And in every respect, they are promoting the interests of corporate power. There's a problem to this. The coronation of a king unpopular among the middle classes from which these activists are overwhelmingly drawn was an ideal spectacle to create and foster the appearance of being anti-establishment in the eyes not only of the public, but I would suggest 
more importantly, in the growing number of environmental activists. It was pointed out that while the Joss Stop Oil activists stopping the working men and women of London from going about their lives and work are protected by police who refuse to arrest them, those who turned up at the coronation were arrested before they got anywhere near the supposed protest. I'd suggest that rather than a protest, the arrest at the coronation were a recruitment drive for Just Stop Oil and their sister organizations. Down with the monarchy is far more likely to attract the support of the university students that fill their ranks than a detailed explanation of the structures of funding and influence between JP Morgan, the World Economic Forum, King Charles, and Extinction Rebellion. There is a reason why the spokesmen for environmental fundamentalism are drawn not from meteorologists, but from young, articulate, privately educated, upper middle class girls in higher education, bred to a sense of entitlement denied to the workers they look down on with such contempt. Protest has for some time now been a form of spectacle by which political parties and their corporate backers manipulate public opinion in their favor. But police arrest, police arrest represents a more subtle and success, successful means of giving rise to powerful emotional responses that circumvent critical thinking and entrench the public more firmly in their allotted tribal identifications. Outrage and anger are the medium of environmental fundamentalism because both are easier to yield to than the demands of critical thought. Confronted with the complexity of global geopolitics and the refusal of the media to produce any sort of explanation more complex than that which a child could understand, protest has become a form of collective therapy for the confused, the angry, and the frightened. Indeed, it is the role of the media to produce citizens who are all three confused, angry, and frightened. Unfortunately, and perhaps understandably, given their youth and ignorance of even recent history, the children elected to front this globalist coup don't understand that the media, the media isn't there to report the news. The media are there, is there to make it. As a rule of thumb, if you're all invited onto the British Broadcasting Corporation news to discuss your cause, your protests are reported across the globe by the most powerful media co corporations and information technology companies in the world. And if you have the legislative backing and police protection of every Western government, it's safe to conclude, I'd suggest, that you don't represent a threat to their hegemony, but you are in fact a part of it. That, however, is a difficult pill to swallow, particularly when experiencing your first taste of apparent power and influence. And your anger has become a sacred war, indeed a jihad of the Western middle classes from which the converts to environmental fundamental, fundamentalism are drawn. And like all fundamentalisms, any disagreement with its dogma is rejected by its acolytes as denial, as the ignorance of unbelievers in their rapidly growing faith, into whose tenets it is their duty and mission to indoctrinate the rest of the population. Like the coronavirus cri crisis that borrowed so much of its dogma the most doctrinal of which was the commandment to follow the science. Environmental fundamentalism is a religious movement formed to conceal and promote the very material and economic goals of a globalist corporate coup. Despite their radical and apocalyptic rhetoric, therefore, and whether they're extraordinarily naive activists know it or not, Just Stop Oil are the paid promoters of the United Nations Agenda 2030. This is why their website, I'm giving you an example here, their professionally printed banners and their media covered protests combine the slick look of consumer advertising with the language of revolution, like Insulate Britain, Animal Rebellion, Extinction Rebellion, Black Lives Matter, The People's Assembly, Momentum, and all the other ostensibly grassroots movements that in practice are astroturfing for their political and corporate backers just Stop Oil has appropriated street protests for the political agenda of globalists. Nearly there. At this year's annual meeting of the World Economic Forum, John Kerry, 
the United States Special Presidential Envoy for Climate Change, described the power of what he described as the select few in Davos to save the planet as extraterrestrial. But behind these exaggerated and frankly ludicrous claims, the actual goal of these US global oligarchs is to financialize the natural world for their benefit, to impoverish the populations of the West, to dismantle what's left of our democracies, and to remove under a permanent state of environmental emergency our human rights, our civil liberties, and our political agency itself. In return for which, they have offered us the sad and pathetic spectacle of protests by people, young and old, gluing their hands to the road, chaining their necks to railing with D-locks, pouring oil over their naked bodies, hurling paint at works of art, and at the behest of billionaires, demanding the reduction in the standard of living, not only of themselves, but of everyone else in the world who isn't wealthy or influential enough to get into the same room as John Kerry. As C.S. Lewis warned us long ago, the goal of any tyranny exercised for the good of the people is to reduce that people to the status, as he said, of infants, imbeciles, and domestic animals. For some time now, we have been behaving like infants and thinking like imbeciles. And if we believe that the coal of the global population to save the planet will stop at animals, domestic and livestock, we are fatally mistaken about the lengths to which the environmental fundamentalists will go to inflict the genocidal consequences of their religious dogma on the rest of the world, as more and more of the damned are beginning to understand we are the carbon they want to reduce. Between 2015 and 2019, I watched the UK Labour Party turn council estate residents protesting against the demolition of their homes by Labour-run councils into voters for the party whose councils were demolishing them, and then blame Labour's neoliberal housing policies on Tory austerity. This is a similar lie, but with far greater resources and on a global scale. Indeed, this nexus of environmental fundamentalism, biosecurity restrictions, woke ideology, corporate takeover of national governments, and managed decline of our standard of living is what the governments of Western, and Western nations, only a few months into the pandemic, informed us was to be the new normal, which we were going to build back better. What they didn't tell us was to what end. This is the politics of environmental fundamentalism. Thank you. You're on Twitter at Simon Elmer 2022, right? I'll put that in the That's right. description. That's right. Yeah, that, that would be great. Uh, anywhere else where we can find your work or any other sites you want to point us to? Yeah, my, my well, the website of our company, my, my arm of it is, is called um, architectsforsocialhousing.co.uk. Thank you very much. Nice, we'll meet, talk to nice you next meeting time. you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.